uh, I gave this lecture at the Royal Society uh, a couple of months ago, and the audience comprised mainly people who were obviously not familiar with mental health at all. And I, and I, and I, and I think that the lecture is really targeting probably not this particular audience, which I think should not be can require much convincing why mental health matters to global health. But in fact, there's a lot of people out there who see it being completely irrelevant. For most people out there, when we talk about global health, our imagination takes us to a child who's malnourished, a mother dying in childbirth, or someone with HIV, AIDS, and TB. Uh, and so much of my talk is about positioning uh, uh, mental health within the framework of global health. And that's what I'm going to try and uh, do today with you. But first, I want to just remind ourselves uh, you know, that global health itself is a very new, relatively young discipline, barely 10 years old. In fact, the first definition of global health that I see in any, on, one, any one of the academic literature was only about four years ago, led by Jeff Copland. So one must remember that it's a very youthful discipline that l really owes much of its history to a century of work in a variety of disciplines, anthropology, uh, um, uh, medicine, uh, and public health, all of which go, to, and of course, all the other social sciences, uh, such as politics and economics. But I, uh, for me, the three principles that uh, global health really is distinguished from its predecessors, which, such as tropical medicine in the colonial period and, and, and international health uh, in the post-colonial period, are these three uh, important criteria. First of all, that the priorities of global health mean that they must be set locally based on the burden of disease in a particular context. Secondly, that a driving moral force is that of justice, social justice, and of course the central theme on social justice is health inequalities. Uh, and the third is that, and I think the best way I can describe this as my good friend Srinath Reddy, the president of the Public Health Foundation puts it, tropical medicine and international health was all about what we uh, in the more privileged parts of the world can do for you in the less privileged parts of the world. Uh, global health is about what we can all do together cooperatively and collaboratively to help improve the health of all people who have to live and share the resources of our tiny planet. So I'm going to actually now uh, uh, so, uh, go through each of these points very briefly to illustrate how mental health lies. Not, it's not just relevant to global health, but in fact lies at the very heart of global health, starting firstly with the burden of disease. Now, Lawrence has already mentioned the burden of disease. I'm not going to labor this point. The burden of disease is a foundational principle of global health more broadly. Uh, and I think uh, we need to uh, acknowledge the important work done by several institutions around the world in producing the metric called the DALI. Uh, it's a very complex metric. Most of us find it very confusing. Nevertheless, it is the only metric we have that allows us to compare diabetes with HIV AIDS, with child mortality, etc. And it's basically a, a, com a composite of the number of uh, of the impact of a health condition on uh, quality of life and the impact of a health condition on life expectancy. And using that single metric called the DALI, we've discovered some startling things about 15 years ago. And I think this is important to remember the history here. This is one of the very important triggers to global mental health. What we discovered according to these authors, none of whom are psychiatrists or mental health professionals, um, is that depression landed up nearly at the top of the list alongside things like childhood pneumonia and diarrhea. And I should tell you the 2012 report, which will be out this year, reconfirms this with a much more robust uh, bottom-up evidence base. That if you combined all the mental and neurological disorders together into one pot, they, ac uh, they accounted for about 15% of the total burden of disease. And even if you estimated just about 5% of the world's population uh, had a mental illness, and by mental illness here I mean the severe mental health conditions, such as the ones that Lawrence showed, psychosis, uh, alcohol dependence, severe depression, etc., it is estimated as a conservative number of about 400 million people on our planet, most of whom live in the developing world. <coughs> but of course, the DALI being a very strange metric in global health, still the most important metric is death. Mortality is by far the driving uh, uh, priority setting uh, uh, metric. And it has to be said, mental illnesses don't kill as often as many physical illnesses, but they do kill particularly in one age group, uh, and that's young adults. Um, so as we showed in this paper that was published in The Lancet a few years ago, a few day, a weeks ago, uh, that uh, it seems time has, so much time has elapsed. <laughs> it, it, but there you are, this is the wonderful workshop we've had. It seems a long time. Uh, but anyway, this was only two weeks ago. Uh, and, and what we showed is that suicide now is the leading cause of death in young people in India as it is in China and many other Asian countries and Latin American countries. It is a shocking statistic. When you read the paper, you'll discover that suicide now kills as many young women in India as maternal mortality. And I think we all know how important maternal mortality is in global health and how unimportant suicide is. We also know, of course, that suicide, like maternal mortality, is preventable and modifiable through public health interventions. <coughs> 
And finally, of course, there is no health without mental health. I won't labor this point. I think everyone acknowledges that. The second important uh, uh, principle of global health is that of justice, justice around the nature of health inequalities in all populations. And I think it's important to, uh, again, acknowledge a completely diff another, another uh, important paradigm, again, coming from outside mental health, like the global burden of disease does not come from mental health, neither does this particular piece of work that was championed by Amartya Sen and his colleagues who were commissioned by the World Health Organization to produce uh, the Social Determinants of Health a report. Uh, those of you who haven't seen it must read it. It's the best report I've ever read on so social determinants of health, and I can speak a lot about that, but I won't except to say that as part of the whole uh, exercise that took several years, uh, I worked with a group of colleagues in a number of places, uh, mainly from Cape Town, to produce the evidence base that really examined the social determinants of mental health, ill health. And of course, not surprisingly, as all of us know, uh, uh, there's a very strong and uh, interconnected uh, relationship between uh, social determinants and mental disorders. In spite of the evidence of burden and, in, and the social determinants, another great uh, important example of inequity is how mental health resources are actually financed. In this particular slide, you will see that in the low-income countries of the world, less than ha about half of 1% uh, of the total health budget uh, is actually given to mental health care, even though the, the burden of disease in the poorest countries of the world is about 10%. And of course, you see these inequities all the way through to high-income countries, presumably like Canada, where about 25% of the burden of disease is due to mental illness. So inequities are global. They're not just about one particular region of the world. It isn't surprising then that if you under-resource a particular sector as, as massively as mental health has been, that people with mental illness do badly. And in this particular slide, you see a, a very startling finding coming from perhaps one of the most equitable parts of the world, Scandinavia. And what this slide shows us is the life expectancy gap between, develop, uh, between people with and without mental illness in three Scandinavian countries for men and women across several time periods. And I'm not going to run through the slide in any detail, simply to say in the most equitable societies of the world, people with mental illness live 20 years shorter lives than people without mental illness. In countries such as the one I work in, the difference in life expectancy is more than 50%. And of course, these are for conditions that are not fatal, uh, and clearly they point strongly to an inequity in the distribution and availability of resources uh, uh, and simply an unfairness with how mentally, uh, people with mental illness are treated. In fact, it's not surprising if, if, if you speak to anyone with a mental illness in most parts of the world, you're likely to hear stories of hidden suffering, uh, hidden shame, uh, and indeed, in many places, discrimination and human rights abuses, perhaps most tragically of all, uh, in the institutions that have been built, mostly in the colonial period, to care for people with mental illness. This is an image that was sent to me a few months ago from a mental hospital uh, in West Bengal. As you can see, a psychiatric nurse moving menacingly towards a cowering patient with mental illness holding what is a stick. Uh, it's, this is an extremely violent picture for me. Uh, and this is actually the least disturbing of a huge archive of images that have been collated over the last 10 years about the conditions in mental hospitals. Sadly, though, uh, discrimination in human rights also take place at home. Uh, my colleagues Alex and Ricky took this image in the Philippines. All you can see is the hand of a woman uh, behind a locked door where she spent a number of years uh, suffering from a severe mental illness. Um, she got out of that particular door, maybe Alex will correct me, uh, after she was given access to medical care uh, for her psychosis. She was, we have no idea if oh, she's and of course, that some of us who championed the idea that there are alternative forms of care, yes, there are, of course, alternative forms of care, but sadly, uh, abuses can take place there too, such as this healing shrine in southern India, where 25 people with mental illness died because they were chained to their beds uh, when a fire broke out in the middle of the night. This is a, this is a, in my, uh, my mind, this is, this is a, a fundamental human rights crisis. Uh, and, and it's not surprising that one of the doyens of our field, uh, Arthur Kleinman, described this as actually a failure of humanity. And I've often questioned my, uh, myself, you know, uh, why is it that, for example, if these, if these statistics were used uh, to display the condition of women compared to men, for example, which in fact they're pretty bad as well in many other indicators, but if I had showed these, if, if, if the, it wasn't people with mental illness, but women I was comparing with men, or people with HIV and without, or people in Abu Ghraib prison even, um, you know, you, we can all remember the global outrage there was. It, does, it strikes me as amazing that actually there isn't such a global outrage that this is going on under our watch, us especially as custodians of mental health care. And I've often struggled to try and understand why. And I think one of the reasons why is because some of us perpetrate the myth that mental illness does not exist. 
Now, I'm very conscious here that, uh, you know, that, that, that there is a raging debate ongoing in our world at the moment uh, about the boundaries uh, between med mental illness and, and the kind of everyday misery, the miseries of everyday life. I'm also extremely conscious uh, and very concerned uh, by, uh, by, the, by the public anxiety about a psychiatry that is medicalizing more and more of everyday human life uh, and a psychiatry that is increasingly reductionist and is increasingly consumed and indeed corrupted by the pharmaceutical industry. I share these concerns totally. But I think it's extremely important, indeed, it is a moral imperative that we do not confuse these disputes about the boundaries between the everyday trials and tribulations and mental illness with the suffering of hundreds of millions of people with severe mental illnesses from severe depression to intellectual disability around the world who have absolutely no care at all. Over a century of research on, on mental illness around the world, and this is from a biomedical and, and anthropological perspective, these are both in fact Western disciplines, it's important to remember, anthropology is not, uh, is also carries its own baggage uh, uh, from the West. A century of this research has clearly demonstrated that all the cultural factors profoundly shape every aspect of the mental illness experience, from the way it is expressed to the way it is acted upon, there is equally no doubt that the major categories of mental disorders can and have been identified in all societies and cultures around the world. Let not the nosological disputes that are consuming DSM-5 and American and, and Western psychiatry be allowed to minimize or dismiss the suffering of people in other countries or distract from the moral imperative that we have to reach out to them. Mental illness is not, as some very arrogant commentators have suggested, an Americanization of the world. I'm sorry, mental illness has existed in my country before America existed. And mental illness has certainly existed in my country before psychiatry or the pharmaceutical industry as we know it existed. To try and pretend that mental illness is an invention of America, the pharmaceutical industry or psychiatry, is to do complete injustice to the history of medicine around the world. I'm going to turn to the final point, which is the two with global solutions uh, for, for global problems. Uh, and I think here uh, is what I think is one of the most exciting things that's emerging from the developing world, as you'll see in a moment, which has great lessons for the, for the better resourced world. Now, uh, Lawrence has already touched on one very important global document, MHGAP. Uh, uh, I, I will completely agree with all the people who feel that this is only a toolkit. It is not meant to be a prescription. In fact, I think it's got, it's got lots of problems with implementation. The idea, though, is that it's the first step. It's a toolkit that now needs to be adapted and modified to make it contextually appropriate for delivery in different parts of the world. And of course, delivery is the key issue, because even though we have a lot of evidence about what works, these are the astonishing figures. Even in the rich countries, uh, we are told that up to half of people with mental illness do not receive these evidence-based interventions. Of course, that so-called treatment gap approaches 90% in other parts of the world. And one very important reason for this treatment gap is the enormous shortage of mental health human resources. Now, in my country, 1.2 billion people live in that country, and if, for a hypothetical, uh, if you can imagine a hypothetical situation, that we have the same number of psychiatrists in India to the population as we had in Britain, which is the other country with which I have a very strong tie and history with. And if I had to uh, apply the same number uh, as we see in Britain to India, I would expect roughly about 150,000 psychiatrists in India. In fact, we have about 2% that number at about yeah. 3,000. Uh, as, 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 as another colleague of mine, Jürgen Onutza, uh, puts it very nicely, there are more psychiatrists in San Francisco Bay, Bay Area than the whole of sub-Saharan Africa. And so before we begin to imagine that there's some kind of ma you know, huge invasion of psychiatry and psychiatrization of mental illness in the developing world, just bear up for a moment the actual facts. There are only 3,000 psychiatrists for 1 billion people. I, I, I think it would be astonishing if these 3,000 people could actually psychiatrize everyday life in India. It's important to remember that actually the real problem I I in terms of global health and public health in developing countries is that we've got shortages of human resources for virtually every discipline of healthcare. And my good friends and colleagues, and I learn a lot, not from psychiatry anymore, but in fact I learn a lot from what's happening in HIV, AIDS, maternal and childhood. Those are actually my inspirations. My inspirations come from global health more and more. And these are the sorts of inspirations that, I, uh, uh, that drive me at the moment. For example, this terrific book that I read 15 years ago, and in many ways really stands at the heart of a lot of my own philosophy and thinking, people's health in people's hands. I don't think I need to labor what this particular book is about. 
But in summary, it describes amazing community-led initiatives uh, about uh, really taking back healthcare into the hands of ordinary people. In these sorts of books, you read about how you can deliver babies, diagnose newborn pneumonia, etc., in the hands of properly trained and supervised lay health workers. There's also, of course, this is called task shifting. I'm sure those of you who are familiar with global health will know this is a word which has become very popular. And indeed, over the last 15 years, there's now been a scientific literature that has built, built up around task shifting in the form of randomized control trials and, system, uh, and systematic reviews. Amazingly, you can task shift for HIV AIDS care. For anyone who knows how complex HIV AIDS care is, that alone is an astonishing example of how our fellow disciplines in other areas of medicine have actually been making incredible progress in improving access to care. Okay, boy, I'm going to rush now. But quickly to tell you, uh, there is a, uh, there is a, over the last 10 years, perhaps one of the most exciting things happening in global mental health has been the innovative examples of task shifting and experiments in task shifting in mental health care. So Paul, I'm going to give you three examples of depression. Paul Bolton and his colleagues in rural Uganda showed that you had 95% recovery rates when lay health workers delivered a psychological treatment for depression compared to 45% in the comparison villages. Atif Rahman, my dear friend and colleague from Pakistan, showed that 75% of, uh, of mothers with maternal depression recovered compared to 41% uh, uh, due to a lady health visitor delivered uh, cognitive behavior therapy inspired intervention. And our own trial, the largest in psychiatry in the developing world, showed that a lay counselor sitting in primary health centers uh, could treat depression and anxiety with 70% recovery rates compared to 50% in the comparison health centers. There have also been now similar examples for a number of other mental health conditions and others actually in progress. So this is the Asha Gram initiative in, 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 in rural India showing the use of community workers uh, and, and now there's been a randomized control trial of the same intervention in three sites of India mm -hmm. uh, which we'll soon be publishing that demonstrates similar results and also similarly for supporting families affected by dementia uh, 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 as you can see a lay worker there as well. Now if I had to draw together all these different experiments uh, in task shifting and ask myself, what are the key lessons that one can learn uh, that, that really lie, in my mind anyway, at the heart of a successful task shifting uh, operation? I've coined this Hindi uh, acronym. I love acronyms, uh, uh, but this time around, I've actually chosen in, uh, a Hindi acronym to coin what I think are the key ingre ingredients. Sundar is a word that actually means attractive. In my mind, there are five key ingredients. Firstly, we need to simplify the way we communicate mental health issues. We need to strip away all the jargon that surrounds psychiatry and indeed medicine more generally. Secondly, we need to unpack our interventions into smaller components that can be transferred to less trained uh, people. Thirdly, we need to deliver it not in our institutions but close to where people live, for example, in community and primary care settings. Fourthly, we need to use who's out there rather than try and fantasize who we need uh, because there's a lot of people out there in the ordinary community who can deliver healthcare. And lastly, the few specialists that do exist need to be playing quite fundamentally different roles. They need to be playing roles of quality assurance, supervision, support, capacity building, and providing referral pathways for those individuals who are suffering from very severe mental health problems. But what's really sundar about the idea of task shift to me isn't only that it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's sundar because it's an idea to me that has global significance. Because all of the idea of task sharing emerges from the lack of resources that you see in many parts of the world. I think it has ter terrific uh, 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 importance for the rich world as well. Not only because mental health care costs are spiraling out of control, most of which are being driven by, by, by human resource costs, but I think also because mental health care has become so ridiculously professionalized and so removed and remote from ordinary people and communities that actually task sharing that's coming from the developing world may in fact perhaps democratize and humanize mental health care up in the north as well. The final few slides, uh, I think what, uh, what I'd like to conclude by saying, I think we know what works uh, in terms of many things. Of course, we also don't know many things, but let's try and implement at least what we know. Uh, and I think the key next step, we have some ideas of how to deliver it, and I think the key next step is to deliver uh, a further evidence and build capacity on how to scale these evidence-based interventions through established platforms of care. The good news is that global mental health as a movement has been able to mobilize incredibly large amounts of people and resources to actually finally address the unmet need for care. There are global health, new global networks. The great thing about these global networks is that they're mostly led from the south, such as the prime network that is led from South Africa. 
The capacity building, for example, many new programs in both uh, developed and developing countries, but perhaps most excitingly, because global health's primary audience isn't researchers, it's actually governments, because it's fundamentally li uh, it, fun it, it lies on a fundamental principle of universal health care for all through tax-funded systems. This is the foundational principle of global health. And the wonderful news is that many countries are beginning <coughs> to scale up services for mental health care in a universal health care model, including, I'm absolutely thrilled to tell you, my own country, which two, three days ago now, um, posted its new national mental health program on its website. Do take a look at it and you will see how a bottom-up consultation process can meet the top-down evidence-based approach to provide a, a new model and a new vision for, district, uh, for, for mental health care uh, in, in a country like India. Finally, the guiding principles, again, to remind you of what global health, mental health is about, are the same guiding principles for global health. Universal values, because these are universal to all human beings around the world, for example, promoting a life uh, with dignity and access to care for people who are unwell. However, implementation through contextual adaptation with local agenda setting and multi-stakeholder involvement. A very important emphasis though, not only on culture, but also on incredibly important issue of scalability. Whatever we do is not for 20 or 30 people, but for several billion people. And the idea that knowledge flows in all directions, not only in the single direction. And most importantly, I think we should remind ourselves, we've certainly missed this particular goal, Health for All by the year 2000, and we probably won't be achieving, achieving it in my lifetime anyway. But still, I think, armed with that knowledge that I think we can convert every member of the community with appropriate support and supervision into a potential healthcare provider, perhaps the promise of Health for All is now within reach. And it seems to me one of the driving forces of global health and global mental health is that for us to achieve Health for All, we will need to involve all in that journey. And in the case of mental health in particular, we need to involve actively as partners, people affected by mental illness. And I'll close by saying this is one of the reasons why some years ago, uh, the movement for global mental health was founded as a sort of a virtual platform where professionals and people from civil society could stand together shoulder to shoulder as equal partners calling for the rights of people with mental illness to receive the care that we know can transform their lives. Thank you. Right? And I think uh, the idea of recovery lies at the heart of global mental health, the idea that you do not need biomedical approaches to achieve inclusion. Uh, I think there's some key words that we use from other movements as well, like the disability movement, and the disability movement frequently uses the word citizenship and inclusion. So in a lot of our work with severe mental illness, those are the terms we use as well. Uh, and I think the, the, the problem, of course, is that there are only 3,000 psychiatrists, there are even fewer social workers. Uh, so the professional uh, disciplines of social work, rehab, uh, uh, etc., are even less present uh, in most parts of the world. For example, where, uh, in India there are about 600 speech therapists. You know, there's even fewer speech therapists than there are actually. Uh, so it's not like as with the thousands of other people out there. And so a lot, of the, a lot of the use of lay workers is actually not to replace psychiatrists, it's actually to replace all these other absent professional groups, case managers, social workers, and so on. And so psychiatrists can finally see themselves alongside psychologists, not just uh, mental health professionals, can see themselves working as part of a team which includes all these other professionals that currently are not in fact available.